readily available everywhere we go, we had to have a higher fat content. So in order to do that, and there was no one giving us instructions, that's why that tastes better to us. Okay, and if you're sitting there going, I like broccoli better. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. Okay. People are energized by problem solving because if we couldn't solve a problem when we were cavemen, you know what happened? We died. Okay? So we are naturally energized by problem solving. One of the silliest jobs I ever had, I was in high school, I worked at Chuck E. Cheese. Are you guys familiar with Chuck E. Cheese? And yes, I did have to dress like the giant rat occasionally. And no, it did not smell nice in there. <laughs> They made me a trainer. I was part of the Rat Pack, right attitude trainer. Okay, very exciting when I was 16. But they talked about training people and they said, show them how to do it, tell them how to do it, do it with them, let them do it on their own. Okay, and it was just a stupid little company, stupid little position making $8 an hour or whatever I was making. Okay, but it always stuck with me because people are energized by problem solving. Oh look, I did it. People always want that sense of things. People need that control and autonomy. If someone else does it for me every time, I have no sense of success. So those teenagers you have that play the video games, oh, I just need to get past this level. Well, do they want their friend to get past the level for them? Because then what's the point? Okay, you can just play the whole game for me and I'll say I did it. I'll take the controller at the beginning and at the end. It's no different in the workplace. We want to see that we have success. That's why no one likes micromanagers. You know, no one in the interview says, well, I'm really looking for a job that can provide me with a micromanager and just tell me all this. No, because we want to know that our success had something to do with us. People want meaning and purpose. Why am I actually doing this? Why does it matter? You can, be, you can talk to people that, to you, it's the dumbest job, the most boring job. Oh my god, I can't believe I would never do this job. But if they care about it, that resonates. And that helps other people. And they're naturally curious, because if we weren't curious, we didn't extend that curiosity, we would never enhance our learning. Let people solve their own problems to some extent. Give them the tools they need, provide them with the guidance, let them solve the problem, and then they see you as a leader and a resource, and they want to be more like you. Who's that? Jimmy Fallon, okay, host of The Tonight Show. Who, what do you think of when you think Tonight Show? Who thinks Carson? Okay, Leno. It's the biggest show. There's about a million nighttime shows out there. Okay, I host one at 4.30 in the morning. It's called the I Had Too Much Coffee Too Late in the Evening Show. It's a really good show. Um, he got the big stage. Is he the funniest person on the planet to be on a comedy talk show? No, probably not. He's a funny guy. You know what he is? He's positive and authentic. That's what he is. Okay? When he interviews somebody, it's like a seven-year-old interviewing a superhero. Doesn't matter who it is, and it gets you excited about that person. You know, I had no idea Marco Rubio was so fascinating with those boots he wears. Right? He was on a couple weeks ago. Um, he's a very positive person. That's what got him the job. He's very authentic. What he was known for on SNL was not being able to keep it together during a skit. He would always break because he's authentic. It was funny to him, okay? He's not afraid to make fun of himself. I think those two things are why he's in that position. All right? Don't smile until Christmas, right? I told you they told me that. That's not me. That's not me at all. There was a year, it was the best year in education I ever had. Um, and in the beginning, I actually had students complaining about me, which I'd never had, and I was devastated. And I was trying to replace somebody who had started this psychology program. And I was trying to be just like them because they told me how great she was. And I said, no, that's not me. And I apologized to every one of my classes. I said, things are going to be different. And I changed. It was the most successful year I ever had. You know? And I was being myself. Now, some people, you shouldn't smile until Christmas. Some people, that's your personality. Don't try and be something that you're not because that never leads to success. If you've ever gone on a blind date or you have a friend that has, they never come back and say to you, you know, how, well, how was the date? It was great. They were so fake. Oh, I loved it. They were so fake. Okay? Girls that are attracted to the bad boy, right? So we always are, we're attracted to some bad qualities. None of them are ever fake. No one ever says that. We love authenticity. The people who win the awards, the Oscars, are the ones that are faking it in the most authentic way. <laughs> Strong team. Anybody from Chicago here? 
Okay. Not from, but all right. 96 Bulls, best NBA team of all time, still have the winningest record. These are their three key players. Now imagine these as the three key people in some of your departments. Okay. Do they go out for a beer after work a lot? Probably not. All right. Michael Jordan, greatest athlete of all time. Scottie Pippen, who would have been the best player on most other teams and had to take a back seat to Jordan, takes a special personality. And Dennis Rodman, who hangs out with the dictator of North Korea. Okay. Not similar personalities. When they brought Rodman to the team, they probably approached Jordan and said, hey, can we do this? Okay. Yes, because I want to win. A players recruit A plus players. Guy Kawasaki said that. B players recruit C players. How do you make yourself look tall? You get a bunch of other tall people, and you go, wow, look at all those tall people. Or you get a bunch of short people, okay? And then you look a lot taller. The recipe for winning and for leadership and success and happiness is that. Accepting each other's differences and realizing that you have a goal in mind. And sometimes we can't look past that sort of thing. Engagement. A company's goal is to create employee evangelists and customer evangelists. And they can create customer evangelists through their employee evangelists. Anybody recognize the logo on my bag here? St. Jude, St. Jude Children's Hospital. Who's familiar with it? Okay, well, get familiar with it. All right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just serious. Um, they provide treatment for kids with catastrophic diseases, and no family ever gets a bill. You've got to fly across the country to the best treatment center. They cover everything, a hotel, everything, because the last thing a family should have to worry about is a bill. If you've ever gone online and seen like those charitable organizations where the CEO makes like $40 million and only like 6% trickles down to the actual people, this is the opposite of that. It's such a worthwhile cause. And I believe in it and I talk about it all the time. I run a mud run for it up in Huntersville every year, the Warrior Dash. I use Amazon Smile, if you've ever heard of that. It's just like Amazon, but it donates 0.05% to your charity every time you make a, a purchase. And I talk about it in almost every event that I do. And they don't send me a check. Wish they would, OK? But they don't send me a check. But I'm passionate about it. I'd be willing to bet a couple people go check it out. Maybe someone sets their Amazon Smile profile on that. So I've done my part in evangelizing and sharing information. That's what you hope people do about your company, even if it's the most boring, mundane thing in the world. You know what? It's not the most exciting work, but man, the people there are just so fantastic. I would never want to leave. It feels like family. Okay? Or the work is just so fantastic, it gives me meaning. I feel like I'm doing something worthwhile and leaving a better mark on the world. That's who you want at happy hour saying, hey, here's who I want. Tell me if I'm wrong. The best hires, are they employee referrals? Because people know, here's what it takes to be successful here. All right? Your best employees are the ones that want their family and friends to work there. Not the ones that say, hey, listen, I know you need a job really badly. And this pays a lot, but please, please, please don't apply here. Okay? That's the opposite. How do we do that? We engage people. Is that through some kind of paperwork or process? It's through people. Okay? It's the human and human resources. 100 million workers in the US, do you know what percent are engaged, actually like or love their job? 20, 30. You can always tell who hates their job when they're like, six, six percent. <laughs> <laughs> it is 30, okay? Worldwide, which we're becoming more of a global economy, it's only 13. So I think you're going to see that drop even more. Okay, good news. Who do you want working for you? People are engaged. People who are just not engaged, are they productive? Not really. They push papers, they get stuff done, okay? But you can get a lot more done. You can get rid of them if you hire a couple more engaged people. And the actively disengaged, like I said, if you fantasized about how you would quit if you won the lottery, if you've gone in and actually tried to sabotage your company. <laughs> I had a friend that worked for a company in New Jersey, and he hated it. He was miserable there. And I said, oh, you know, when I first started the business, I was looking to get some t-shirts. I was having this kickoff event, and it was an apparel company. I said, do you know where I can get this type of t-shirt, good cost, good quality? He said, actually, my company would do a really good job, but please don't give them the business. Okay, And you're like, oh, that's terrible. Now think about this for a second. Hurricane Sandy happens. They lose their power. There's a gas shortage, state of emergency. People can't go into work for four days. So even if I wanted to go into work and was willing to make the trek, okay, I couldn't work. You know what he did? He took people's vacation time. Mm -hmm. 
And now you're like, good for that guy who said not to be t-shirts from him, right? Actively disengaged. They had a morale problem. You know what their response was? They got a ping pong table. Okay. <laughs> Google's got ping pong tables, right? They had a sign out sheet. You had to sign out the paddles and the ball with a timestamp. <laughs> okay. So you know what that ping pong table got? Cobwebs. Yeah. Okay. People don't understand how to do it. So actively disengaged, you're working against the organization. That's crazy that one fifth of people are like that. That's crazy. If you work in a 100 person organization, that's 20 people. <gasps> what do the employees want? What do you think employees want? Most important thing. <coughs> Respect, to be heard. security, to be heard. Anybody say money? No one's saying money? Come on. Come on. Someone thinks it's money. Thank you, David. Okay. <laughs> to be appreciated, number one answer on the board. Engaged. Treated like a human being. Job security and pay. Of course pay is important. Right. Problem is when they gave this same survey to managers, they ranked it in the opposite order. So if I'm giving someone a bunch of money and all they wanted was time, even though you're giving them something positive, you're sending the message like you don't care. You ever get a gift from somebody? It's always nice to get a gift, right? But you totally can't stand the gift and all it does is send the message that the person doesn't know you at all and it's like a disappointment. My father loves to give gifts that he would like. Okay? It's like, Dad, I don't, I don't need a bolo tie. You know? Why would I want that? So it just sends the message like they didn't care enough to find out what I'd actually like. So even though you're giving them something positive, like a raise or a bonus, all they wanted was time. All they wanted was for you to say, you know what? You always get your work done. Why don't you cut out at 2 o'clock on Friday? It doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't cost you anything. You become more engaged. You tell your friends what a great place to work. Okay? When I left teaching, I did a presentation a few months ago to a bunch of administrators. And I said, why do you think I left teaching? And this guy, who obviously hated his job, was in the front. He's like, for money. I said, no. I said, in teaching, the one thing you usually have is job security, okay, engagement. You're treated like a person. And I worked at a school where wasn't appreciated, worked in the richest county in the country in Virginia, and they froze salaries. Again, okay? When Michigan needs to freeze salaries in 2008, you understand. When the richest county in the country does it, they do it to save a buck. So we're not appreciated. They were cutting teachers based on time in the county. Not your ability as a teacher, not your time as a teacher overall, not your time as a teacher in the state. Time in the county. Your best teacher in the building, okay, 30 years, one in the county, worst teacher in the building, two years overall, but they're both in the county, they keep their job. Am I engaged? Went to my principal, my wife worked in the same county as a teacher, Am I really in danger of, you know, are we, are we really in danger of look, losing our jobs? Should we start preparing? No concern or care whatsoever. Okay, so one, two, and three are out. You already know five's out, even though it's pretty good pay for a teacher. And now four's out too. Well, if I don't have any of those things, I might as well leave and go somewhere else. But if you could have kept me with one, two, and three, I probably would have hung in there. There's another activity on your table or it was sent to you via email, okay? If you do that now. Your dream job. If you're working your dream job, that's fantastic. I very rarely meet people who are. And when I say dream job, I mean, what's your dream job? Like probably like what it was when it, you were seven, not, well, you know, I'd have to give up my 401k and we'd have to really, get, don't consider all those logistical factors. Like, what would you want to be, an astronaut or whatever the case was? All right. I wanted to be catcher for the New York Yankees. My knees and my lower back did not at all. Okay. I love what I'm doing right now. I absolutely love it. Okay. It's a very difficult job, but I love it. Best answer I ever heard for this, a woman said to me, I would want to be Brett Michaels' personal nurse. I said, uh, okay. You know, usually you kind of set things up and you know somebody's going to say something. Like there might be that one guy who says hungry to Gandhi. I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> so write that down or think it or whatever. Type it. What that dream job was. Anybody want to share? I always need new material. <laughs> Anybody actor, actress, professional athlete? I'll share. Yes. 
so when I was younger and still now, I think it would be very fun. I'd love to have my own bakery. I love to bake, as most people now know because we sent out our, our little email about fun facts about people. But like you, I love what I do now. Okay. okay. Bakery. Right. Be a baker. Anybody else? Yeah? Okay. Astronaut. <laughs> now, I want you to think of your nightmare job. Hopefully, you're not in it right now. Um, whatever it is, okay, last thing you'd want to do, you'd only do it if this was the only way to put food on the table. For me, it might be Brett Michaels' personal nurse. <laughs> For me, anything monotonous, I couldn't do it. A bathroom attendant, I would not like that job. I taught middle school for one year. I'm amazed I got out of there alive. <laughs> Love teaching high school, hated teaching middle school. Those are special, special people that can do it. <laughs> nightmare job. Anybody want to share their nightmare job? Call center. Call center. OK, good one. Yes? Window washer in a high rise building. Window washer in a high rise building. Okay. Some people say doctor because they can't stand the sight of blood. Um, anybody else? Anybody say janitor, custodian, something along those lines? That's one of the top answers. You know whose names I will never forget? The two janitors at my middle school, Cecil and Vinny, made a difference in my life. I might forget some of my teachers' names, but I remember the two janitors. And they were union workers, and they made more than some of the teachers and retired after 20 years, so they probably were pretty happy. Some people's dreams are other people's nightmares. Some people said doctor and that for a dream, and others said night, that's a nightmare because I can't handle blood. Some people would, you know, love to work in a call center and just, hey, I just do the same thing every day. I check in, I check out. It's a great job for me. Oh, I, could, I, could, I would never want to bake. I can't stand that. I ruin everything I cook. So your dream could be somebody's nightmare and vice versa. It's a very personal situation. Now I want you to think of people you would love to have as colleagues. Hopefully, you actually work with some of these people now. Maybe you worked with them in the past. Maybe they're a friend or family member. If you could pick your group of people, regardless of reality and skill set, who are the people that you would want to work with? Okay, Think about that, write them down, what have you. For me, I get along very well with my wife. She does a lot for the business. We would work well together. For other people working with their spouse, okay, they would kill each other. And three other people that I taught with. And I would take them in the business world with no business experience in a heartbeat. Because I know they care, I know they're driven, I know they have a good work ethic. And I know they could pick up the training. Those are the people I would love to have as colleagues. Now think of the people you would never want as colleagues. Maybe you work with them right now. Maybe it's a family member or a friend. Okay. Hey, great friend, but if I had to work with them, oof. All right. No way. So jot those people down. <laughs> what? Best answer I ever got was Gary Busey. I said I can't really disagree with that. Although it would probably be fun and not monotonous. Now what I want you to do is that. Draw a line from the dream job to the nightmare people and the nightmare job to the dream people. And you know what just happened with your job? It flipped. Your dream became a nightmare and your nightmare became a dream. For most people. All right. In 2012, I lost my home in Hurricane Sandy. It's why I'm here. Okay, had to run away to North Carolina. And after things were, were settled, and you were actually able to go and see what was left, I called a friend of mine and I said, "Hey, I'm going to go down. I'm going to throw out most of what I've collected over my life, and then I'm going to go help some other people who need it. Are you interested in coming?" "Oh, absolutely." And he brought four guys that he worked with that I'd never met a day in my life. And we went down there, and like I said, for half of the day, we were throwing out stuff in my house. Um, and then the next half of the day, we went to this woman's house. And after about 10 minutes, we're like, man, this place is really dirty. Like, I know it was a hurricane and like one of the worst natural disasters in history, but this is bad. And I realized the woman was a hoarder, and her house backed up to a sewage treatment plant. Okay? Yeah, it was nice. Um, one, of my, one of the guys that was helping me was carrying out a soaked mattress, seawater and oil and sewage and whatever, and actually vomited, OK? Sounds like a fun job, right? No, it sounds like a nightmare job. At the end of the day, there's a picture of us. Some of us don't have pants on. Some of us don't have shirts on, because I didn't want anybody wearing sewage-covered clothes in my minivan that I have to take my kids in, OK? But we all are wearing a smile. 
I don't show you the picture because some of us don't have pants on. <laughs> um, so for me especially, if I said to you, hey, do you want to spend your day throwing out all of your personal belongings, you know, your yearbooks and all this other stuff, and then go somewhere else and work in a bunch of sewage, you'd be like, no, I'm, I'm OK. I'll pass. All right? But because of who I was doing it with and what I felt I was doing for someone else, it, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Do I wish I could have just done it for someone else and not had to do it for myself? Of course. But you can very easily turn a dream into a night nightmare. And in your role as leaders in human resources, you have that capability for people. You can turn someone's nightmare job into a dream. And then when you want to talk about metrics and productivity and performance and money and all those other things, that follows. So keep that in mind. Leadership styles. Appliance company hire, okay, they were about this close to bankruptcy. And now they're the number one appliance company in the world. And the difference was a person, was a leader. He came in and said, you know what? Let's tap into people's innate nature to want to succeed and want to have drive. And he appointed teams, self-managing teams, that appoint their own managers and compete for internal talent. Well, this person's a producer. I want them on my team. Here's what I'll give them in exchange. No, 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 we'll give them this. Absolutely unheard of in China. Okay? But he did it and took them from worst to first. That's somebody I call the navigator, being willing to plot a course and other people say, OK, I'll follow you. No, the earth isn't flat. All right? Some people are that navigator. Ford, same thing. This close to bankruptcy, completely turned things around. You know what they did? They brought in a guy. He got rid of most of their stuff. <coughs> say it's not quantity, it's quality. 97 products down to 20. They started the initiative of mobility. Right? Being able to connect your phone and do all those things and not have to touch anything and read your text messages while you're driving without looking down and all those other great things which people factor into buying a car. I'll take less of a car if I can have the higher model that I can listen to my Pandora and I can make hands-free calls and do all those sorts of things. Brilliant. And not you know, thinking outside of the box. And he stopped that CYA culture. He encouraged people to take risks. You would call someone like him a change agent. That's another leadership style. The pope okay, is someone who's an innovator. If you know anything about this pope, he does things completely like, like the pope did that? Are you serious? The people I talk to, they're like atheists. They're like, what do you think of that pope? That pope's pretty cool. OK? Really? All right. A quarter of the people increased how much money they were giving. So you've got the church. You've got an innovator in the church. And it's resulting in dollars. Well, I mean, you can copy that over to business, right? You talk about business innovation, and you talk about money and profit and things of that nature. Innovation is the key. Does anybody know Ken Robinson? Anybody know who he is? Okay. If you know anything about the education system, you're frustrated with the educational system, you want to know why your child, fill in the blank. Okay, there's a great video where he explains it. It's called RSA Animate, something about education. It's someone like drawing at the same time he's talking. Really cool way to consume the information. But in 7, 11, 14 minutes, whatever it is, he makes you clearly understand what happened. Great communicator, great person who can convey purpose and process. Okay? If you stop and think how many times, like, well, what's the purpose for this? All right. Rick said before, what's the common question in school, right? Well, you know. Think about if you ever asked, what do we need this for? Why are we learning this? People want that understanding. Okay? People, it's an easy pill to swallow if you go, you know what, it's a corporate initiative. I've fought with the CEO. i fought with the owner. i fought with whoever on this. I know it doesn't make sense. I know it's a pain in the butt. But it's just something you have to do. That's a much easier pill to swallow than coming up with the, this is for company morale and understanding how to, you know, that whole thing. So he's very good at that. I call him the educator. Some people have that leadership style. You guys familiar with Tony Robbins? Okay, He's a role model of mine. I'm trying to get someone to turn me into a seven-foot Frankenstein with a really deep voice. Has a lot of power as a personal speaker, professional speaker. Okay. But if you've ever seen him, he's extremely passionate and personal. I saw him a few months ago. He was on the Steve Harvey show. 
and he's hugging and kissing Steve Harvey, and oh, it's like, wow, these guys must go way back. And I think it was probably the first time they met. You know, he took Oprah and had her come to one of his seminars, and she's like, oh, I'm going to stay for like an hour, and stayed for like three days. Okay, and they say with him, it's just such an overwhelming amount of passion, and he makes it seem personal in a stadium of thousands of people. You think, oh, he's just talking to me. He has that capability. Some people have that capability, some people don't. Some people are great in one-on-one, -on -one and some people are group. Some people inspire. My goal in my business is to provide information and the inspiration to carry it out. So that's another style. If you don't have that personality, then why not use somebody who does? Nothing wrong with that. So which are you? So you've got your sheets in front of you. Okay, are you a navigator? Are you a change agent? Are you an innovator? Are you an educator? Are you someone who inspires? For me, I consider myself at the bottom two. Do you need to be all five? No way. No one, I don't know if anybody can be all five. Okay. Time management is an important piece of leadership. Very simple. If you don't have any goals, you don't have any priorities. If you know your goals, you know your priorities. I know a guy who was working for um, a small company and 75, 80 people, and he came to me and said, Kurt, I'm having a really hard time understanding you know, how to do this job. I've got 20 projects. I said, okay, seriously, how many projects are you working on? He said, I've got 20 projects. I said, okay, wow. He said, I have no idea what's important. I said, well, the owner's there, right? Oh, yeah, the owner's here. I said, well, go talk to him. So he went in, and he waited till 9 o'clock at night to get in you know, with the owner, and he brought in this list, and he said, I, I really want to do a good job here. I want to, you know, I want to be a good member of the team. I don't know what my priorities are. I was hoping you could help me with that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. He goes, okay, well, I have this project. And the guy goes, oh, well, that's the number one priority. And this person I was working with was like, oh, thank goodness. Now, this is number one. Okay, and what about this one? Oh, you know what? That's number one. And the guy goes, oh, okay. And, you know, scratches that out, puts a one on that, puts a two on the number one. And then he says, uh, okay, what about this one? And after about seven number one priorities, the guy realized nothing was going to get done. And at any one time, they could call him and say, well, where's Project 17? So you know what he did? A little bit of everything. So you got a lot done of a little and nothing tangible. Does anybody here knit or crochet? Would you do it like that? I'm going to make half a hat, <laughs> one glove, OK? Part of a sweater. That doesn't get anything done. You spend the same amount of time doing it, but if you don't have any goals in what you're trying to do, my aunt knits, she sends stuff for my kids all the time, and they love it. It's some of their favorite stuff. Blankets, hats, slippers, gloves, sweaters. But if she tried to start them all at the same time, they wouldn't have anything. It's the same thing in the work world, and sometimes that's all people want you to do is help them prioritize. How do I get this job done when things are so stressful, when I have to go to a professional meeting to work, to something else, okay, and actually have a personal life. I mentioned Costanza before. You guys familiar with Parkinson's Law? This is really all you need to know about time management. Parkinson's Law says things take as long as you give them. So we set this up like almost a year ago, right? So you know how long it took me to do this presentation? About a year. Okay. If she called me two weeks ago and said, hey, I'd like you to come speak, you know how long it would take me to put this together? About two weeks, OK? <laughs> if she called me yesterday and said, I want you to put this together from scrap, I probably would have said no or had something really, really bad. But that's what people do. You know why it takes them eight hours to get their job done? Because they have to be at work for eight hours. You know why it takes them two weeks to get their project done? Because you gave them a deadline in two weeks. Okay? But what if you said to somebody, hey, the sooner you get it done, I can give you something else. And because of that, I can give you a day off without you taking you know, without you using a day. Now all of a sudden, you'd have somebody turn it in. I have a guy, he's a consultant, he's a brilliant, one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Any job he's had, they've said to him, he'll say, well, what's the deadline? Four weeks. Okay, he'll get it done in four days, and then he'll do whatever he wants, and then he'll turn it in a week early. And you know what they think? This guy's a rock star. He got it done a week early. But what if you actually motivated him to be based on performance and not presence? Can you do that? Do you have the power to affect that? Do you have the power to be that guy at the front of the classroom that's willing to take the toddler and do things the right way and follow policy, but do the right thing by people and make maybe a tough time a little less tough? So the last thing I'll say to you is 
no matter what I said to you today, be yourself. If you need to smile before Christmas, smile before Christmas. Because everything that someone says, there's an opposite that's true. Too many cooks in the kitchen spoil the broth, right? People say that all the time. You probably have it in meetings when there's 30 people in a meeting, okay? And about four people need to be there. But then someone could say two heads are better than one. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, out of sight, out of mind. There's always a truth on the opposite end. So regardless of what I tell you or what anyone tells you, be yourself and tap into that authenticity. Find your leadership style and remember that you are someone that people look for to help them make their day just a little bit better. And again, thank you guys for doing that and thank you for having me here today. all so much for coming. Uh, it's always great to see you guys each month and another round of applause for Kurt really quick. Yeah. I see Matt coming my direction because you have something. Yeah, Arthur Beaver just got say. here from um, CMS school and she just needs a minute. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll run to that while she walks up. Um, we look forward to seeing you all next month sure. in March. It is our legal update plan that it will be longer than a regular meeting as it typically is and that will be up on the website for us. Thank you. I, um, I'm sorry to be the last um, person to talk with you guys today. That was fabulous, and I'm a former teacher, and I'm sitting here thinking all those things I was going to say, and it was not going to really matter that much, but they are. Um, my name is Deborah Dunn, and I'm here um, because of Matt Sandinsky. I am an educator of 25 years. For 13 of those 25 years, I taught in high school career and technical education classes. Um, and about a year ago, I was given the opportunity to change jobs, kind of my dream job, 